Welcome everyone to today's Smith in the World panel. It's great to have you here. I'm Anna Silverstein, she, her pronouns, the Assistant Director of Graduate and Professional School Advising here at the Lazarus Center for Career Development. And I'm joined today by my co-host, Emily Beaudry, our internship coordinator. Today's panel on government law and public policy is the last panel of the 2023 Smith in the World Conference series. And so whether you attended the other panels or just today's, um, thank you. And we, we welcome everyone who's taken the time to join us, students, prospective Smithies, faculty, staff, family and friends, supervisors, colleagues, and all others. Um, thank you for being here today with us to hear from these outstanding students. The Smith in the World Conference series is intended to celebrate and share students off-campus ex experiential learning, including internships, community service, research, and study abroad. Students will offer reflections on how these experiences have impacted and enriched their academic and professional paths. For the first 12 years, Smith in the World was held on campus, and then in fall 2020, we switched to a virtual format and we're pleased to see a significant increase in audience numbers and participation. So we are continuing to offer this conference virtually, and we're so glad you decided to join us for this exceptional program. Our panelists today will give short presentations about their summer 2022 off-campus learning experiences, uh, focusing on their projects, the impact these experiences had, and how Smith prepared them. And I'm honored to introduce today's panelists. So first we have Molly Zello, who will be speaking about her internship with Policy Matters Ohio, a nonprofit progressive policy research institute. And then Sitlali Vroras, who will be speaking about her internship with the Santa Fe Dreamers Project, an organization that provides free legal services to immigrants and refugees. And lastly, we'll hear from Lexi Luckett, who will be speaking about how key internships and experiences throughout the course of her time at Smith culminated in her path to law school. Today's session will be recorded, so we ask that audience members please keep your microphones muted. We encourage you to submit your questions for presenters using the chat tool. We'll collect those questions and they'll be addressed after the presentations are finished during our Q&A. So with that, I'll hand it over to our first panelist, Molly Zello. All right, um, let me share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Cool. <clears throat> okay, there we go. All right, so hello, um, my name is Molly Zello and I'm a junior doing a double major in government and statistical and data sciences. And this summer I interned at a state policy institute or think tank basically um, out of Ohio called Policy Matters Ohio. So Ohio was once kind of seen as the bellwether state to give kind of some context. So its electorate was used to be seen in presidential elections as being fairly representative of the median voter. So on election night, like pundits would kind of be like, okay, well, how's Ohio gonna vote? And use that to kind of gauge the rest of the nation. Um, but, you know, after going for Obama twice, the state swung fairly sharply towards Trump in 2016 and subsequently in 2020 by even larger margins. So Policy Matters, which I think was founded in like 2003, um, is existing as a liberal voice in an environment that used to be more conducive to its existence, but has now become increasingly hostile um, and under a lot more scrutiny. So I started working with Policy Matters um, June 2022, and I actually was able to extend my position beyond just the summer into through January 2023 when my report was published. Um, so when I first started working with Will, my supervisor, on this project in June, it was nothing more than an idea. So the what he told me in our first meeting together was he was like, look, in Governor DeWine's State of the State address, he went on about how Ohio is the best state for families. And Will was like, look, <laughs> we know that's not true, um, but we think it can be. So the entire 
like idea behind the project was what can what budget or policy proposals can they put in place to maybe someday transform Ohio State in like status in the national rankings. Um, although this was kind of the original like idea behind the project, it eventually did turn into the um, organization's 2024-2025 state budget document called Ohio's Family Budget, keeping the same kind of goal of let's be the best for families, but changing the um, premise of it a bit, I guess. So I <laughs> did a lot this summer. I'm not going to lie. It was quite fun for me. I also won't lie about that. Um, so again, as I kind of alluded to, this was nothing more than an idea when I first started working on it. So in those first couple weeks with the organization, <laughs> I was just, I, I didn't know what to do. I was very overwhelmed because Will would just kind of be like, just figure, like go research rankings of the states. And I was like, that's it? Like there's not, you're not gonna give me anything else besides that. Okay, I guess so. Um, so what ended up happening was I'd go out and I'd be Googling away and just taking notes. And then after a couple days, I'd just, we'd meet and I'd throw a bunch of things at him. And he would kind of go, okay, maybe, yes, no. Because also, again, he didn't really have a clear vision for it outside of the main idea. So it was very much a collaborative process um, to get to the final place that we eventually reached. So there ended up being 15 like indicators or variables looked at in the final report through four major categories being like family life, um, economic security, um, health and education. And so once we kind of decided, okay, these are what we're gonna look at, um, then I got to get to work digging through various websites and realizing that there's a lot of out of date information out there. Um, and as you can kind of see in the bottom right, organizing it into pretty spreadsheets um, and then ranking it all so that, you know, it's very clear. And one of the other things I did was I also made a sheet for, I called it my metadata sheet, in which case all of the like links and relevant information was tracked so that someone in the future can come back through and understand my thought process behind the document. So they're not just staring at them going, what on earth was this person thinking? So once all that was taken care of, then we could get into the fun part, which is actually figuring out what a policy difference are um and this um, not only in the researching and all that kind of things but about specific like nitty-gritty things that it had never been like necessary for me to know and I probably would have never learned about had I not had this like experience um so one of those one of those examples is health insurance so this is one of the things that Will was pretty set on including looking at people without health insurance from the get-go. And, you know, when I went about starting to research this, I was like, okay, Obamacare, what else is there to know? Turns out there's a lot else to know. Who's surprised? Um, it's not as simple as saying, well, these states have expanded it versus these states haven't. But I spent like over six hours one day just staring at my computer and trying to understand the entire mess behind it, looking at, okay, well, what's a state-based marketplace? Why does that matter compared to a federally facilitated marketplace? What's a hybrid marketplace? How do people even access these services? And it was just a whole jumble, but eventually I made sense of it um, and was able to produce a policy briefing that kind of went into, you know, Ohio should switch from a federally facilitated marketplace to a state-based marketplace because it would give them more ability to help the people that need insurance the most and get them access to these services. Um, so one of my other, I, I call it one of my favorite ones to talk about, even though it's a very tragic, obviously, issue being opioid overdoses. So I don't know how many of you are aware, but Ohio was amongst one of the states that was originally targeted, targeted by Purdue Pharmaceuticals in um, the early 2000s for opioids because it has a large like industrial manufacturing labor force. So when we were going about 
framing this variable, it, we couldn't exactly apply the, the same thought process as we were doing for most of the other ones, looking at what's the best, what, where's Ohio, because it's not exactly fair to compare Ohio's relationship with the opioid crisis to Hawaii's or Nebraska's. Like that's just an unfair comparison to make. So as I kind of went about looking through the data and going through everything, I was realizing, oh, well, New Hampshire, one of the states that was impacted very early on, was actually the only state in 2020 that saw a decline in overdoses, whereas every single other state in the country, including obviously Ohio, saw massive spikes. So once, you know, we decided to compare these two states, I got to get in and start researching, and well, was this intentional? <laughs> you know, great questions to ask. And the answer is yes. The state of New Hampshire has actually made several different initiatives, be it their doorways initiatives, which puts a location in every single county that people can go to to get resources for addiction and treatment and for themselves or loved ones or anyone else to try to destigmatize addiction, um, but also expanding drug courts in counties and getting access to medical treatment in places that otherwise wouldn't have had it. So these are all things that were very much so facilitated by the state government that other states haven't done. And so I was able to put all this into the proposal that we then, for the opioid overdose rate, that was then included in the final project saying, look, Ohio, look what New Hampshire did. They have this great program. You should try to develop something like this because it would really help the people within your borders. So kind of overall, I would definitely say that my perceptions of the, what it would be like to work in government did shift because um, although we all know that the United States is a federal system, personally, I myself and I've witnessed other people kind of getting caught up in the narrative that like the federal government will solve all problems and should solve all problems. When in fact, the state governments, albeit, you know, it can be a little bit less attractive than working for the federal government, they have so much power and control over the lives of the people within their borders. And I feel like that's something that people forget often um, and they shouldn't because, you know, we can see in a lot of states right now that are increasingly pushing these, say, like really conservative policies where the population might actually not be so divided about them or be as conservative as the policies. Um, so it definitely did open my mind to that fact and also just expanding, you know, I hadn't really strongly considered public policy before. Um, I went into this thinking, you know, it'll be a fun experience, something to do. And I definitely have found myself open more to the idea of pursuing further work in public policy, whether that be in like directly through like a master's program or just like something I want to keep, keep my thumb on as I move throughout my education and my career. Um, so thank you. I will stop sharing. Um, okay. Thank you, Molly. Okay, we'll turn it over now to Silali. Okay, can you see my screen? Yes, okay. Let's see. Sorry, I'm just trying to figure this out. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Sitlali Rodas, and I'll be telling you about my internship with the Santa Fe Dreamers project that I had uh, over the summer. And I'll be sharing a little bit about what I learned and what I worked on, as well as touching on a few experiences that were uh, monumental to my understanding of immigration policy in the United States. Um, and this will also include me sharing a little bit about my story and my lived reality as part of this issue. So the Santa Fe Dreamers Project is a nonprofit organization that provides free legal services to immigrants, their work falls into three different categories, which includes the community programs 
team that works on uh, family-based cases, which includes DACA renewals, work authorization, citizenship applications, and then Team Defense provides direct representation and support to people who are in immigration or in immigrant detention. And then the advocacy team organizes alongside people in the community to advocate for the abolition of uh, immigrant detention and provide educational resources to reframe the narrative of who immigrants are. My work mostly consisted of engaging with asylum seekers. Asylum is the legal right to ask a country for protection due to fear of persecution or harm from an individual's home country. So my role in this was to conduct intakes for trans and queer migrants to guarantee them free legal representation upon requesting exemption from Title 42 which is an anti-immigrant policy disguised as a public health policy. Um, and it permits the United States government to expel migrants from the country and turn them away from the border. So this policy makes it even harder to access the political asylum system due to public health concerns. And a result of this policy is that people are forced to wait in Mexico uh, oftentimes in Juarez, where they can be subject to more harm. Uh, okay. So intakes, as an intern, I, I did a lot of intakes, which are the main component of the foundation of a case. These are the forms that legal assistants and Department of Justice accredited representatives look to familiarize themselves uh, with each person that seeks representation. And so the intakes that I conducted were specific to asylum related questions, which usually start with biographical information to gauge previous immigration history. And for us, intakes are really important because it's when we ask people uh, to share the reasons why they are seeking asylum. And so it's important for us to create a space where the person feels comfortable being vulnerable to share traumatic experiences, um, because our goal is to ensure that they feel safe and heard. Um, so during these intakes, it was necessary for me to be strong for our clients because and to listen without reacting in any particular way that would make them feel like they had to protect me from their traumas. Uh, because the details of the story um, and of their experience are fundamental to conveying the urgency behind their case. So we usually ask, uh, I don't know, if you, we usually ask questions of who, you know, these are the questions that we guide ourselves by. I've included them on the, on the slide. As part of this, we went down to the office in El Paso and conducted in-person intakes for queer immigrants living in shelters located in, in Juarez, Mexico. And then here I've included some pictures of the US-Mexico border. On the, on the left, we have the Bridge of Americas, which is one of the ways that you can take to go into Mexico. And on the uh, Right side, we have the Paso del Norte, which is how you get back into the United States or one of the ways. So detention is a way that the United States incarcerates immigrants and separates families. When we went to the detention center, I was talking to a man from Nicaragua and he told me that the reason that they came to the United States was that so that their rights would be protected, but Instead, the rights are taken away daily and are treated, they're treated as less than humans, which goes to show that um, detention centers are really inhumane places. When people are in detention, they are not given clear and accurate information about their rights and uh, immigration laws. So they're often misinformed they're abused and they're treated in other inhumane ways that uh, by ICE officials and, um, and other immigration agents. So our purpose in going to the Cibola Detention Center 
was to give a presentation aimed at providing information about the immigration process to detainees. And when we were there, we had people fill out their own intakes because there were about 50, around 50 or more men. And so it was just not enough time for us to sit with each person and conduct the intakes. And I remember there was a group, there were several of them that came to me immediately after the presentation and started asking me questions about their situations and experiences in the detention center. And so you have to understand that these people are really anxious and really scared of um, what might happen because they, they don't have any idea of what's going on um, with, with their case or if they can get help or once this, you know, once the most available time to get help from. So the best thing that I could do for them in that moment was to listen and to be someone that they felt that they could talk to. Um, and as an intern, I didn't have all the answers, which, which really frustrated me because the thing that most people don't realize is that even the attorneys and the legal assistants don't always have the answers either because the United States immigration system is inherently designed to be overly complicated and inaccessible. So I feel that the foundation of my knowledge relating to the U.S. immigration um, system and U.S. immigration law is rooted in the stories that I would hear about the border or ICE from my parents and other family members. And so what this internship did for me was to solidify my understanding of policies and aspects of immigration law. So if anyone is interested in exploring an area of government or law, or you want to fight and advocate, if this, if this fires you up, I strongly recommend looking for an internship like this one. Um, and Santa Fe Dreamers Project was, a certainly, was certainly a great place for me to intern. Um, this is intense work but it's meaningful and important. And the more the people do this, the more uh, we're making a difference. So next semester, I'll be in DC and I definitely want to keep learning about migration policies because there's still a lot more that I don't know. So I hope that I can continue this type of work, hopefully with, um, you know, with a migration policy institute. Um, and I, Thank you all for being here. And if you feel like you can, if you're able to, um, consider making a donation to the Santa Fe Dreamers Project. Thank you. Thank you so much, Silali. And now we will turn it over to Lexi. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Okay. So, so my name's Lexi. I am going to do my Smith in the World presentation about uh, going from a liberal arts college to law school. And so some things about me, my name is Lexi, I use she, her pronouns. I was the class of 2023 J, and so I actually just graduated in January a few months ago. I'm from Mesa, Arizona, and at Smith, I was a government major with a community engagement and social change concentration, which is administered through the Janvin Center. Um, and so, I was very fortunate and something that I really appreciate about Smith is that they have a lot of funding opportunities for students to get experience exploring different uh, fields. And so when I came to Smith, I uh, did not have a defined career path in mind because I uh, am going to be a first generation professional. And so nobody in my family had gone to a college, anything like Smith or gone to college at all. Um, and so I was also low income. And so I knew that if I was going to be pursuing opportunities that I needed to make sure they were funded. And so while I was at Smith, I got the opportunity to do three summer internships. Uh, and then I also did the Jandon Activist Fellowship at Community Action Pioneer Valley. And so uh, these four internships uh, culminated in 
the steps to law school that were really meaningful to me. And my first one was at the Pioneer Valley Worker Center working at Riquezas del Campos, which is an immigrant led worker owned cooperative farm. I also worked at the Greenfield Court Service Center, which provides free legal information to pro se litigants who are in the court systems, which just means that they're representing themselves without a lawyer. And I also worked at the US Patent and Trademark Office doing diversity, equity, and inclusion work. And then I worked at Community Action Pioneer Valley as a resource advocate where I got to and actually still get to connect low-income families with resources in their area as well as help them apply for financial assistance for rent and utility overage. And so the Pioneer Valley Workers Center and the Greenfield Court Service Center were funded by my Praxis and my Praxis Plus. And then the Community Action Pioneer Valley Internship was funded by the Janin Activist Fellowship. And then I got money from the US government <laughs> for the PTO job. And so all of these experiences are pretty different and not all of them line up exactly with what some people might think the conventional path to law school is. And so for my first summer that I was at Smith, I was working on a farm, uh, which is something I had no experience with. I am from a desert and so it was really shocking to come to New England and uh, be in a place that's like a huge agricultural hub like Western Massachusetts. And so I was working on a farm for a field manager who only spoke Spanish, which is a language that I'm not fully fluent in. And I got the opportunity to learn a lot, not just about farming, but also the experiences of the farm workers in the area, uh, many of whom were immigrants. And then, and as a person of color, that was really important to me because I have certain experiences, but I don't have uh, the experiences of someone who say is an immigrant from Costa Rica and is now a farmer. And so being able to be uh, exposed to different perspectives was really important to me as someone who was thinking about potentially pursuing a career as an advocate. My internship at the Greenfield Court Service Center actually was a little bit more conventional in the path to law school. I was exposed to uh, probate and family court and housing court, and I was basically given the task as an intern of empowering people to be able to represent themselves and give them the information that they needed to navigate the court system. And so I would tell them the steps that they needed to take before they went to their hearing, and then I could help them prepare their documents so that they would make sense and convey all of the details that they needed at the PTO. I got to do DEI work that I was really excited about. I got to um, do, among the things that I did, one of them was get to submit a proposal to the director of the PTO about bringing innovation to the next generation of innovators. So I focused on doing interventions at the um, K through 12 level for students of color specifically. And then we also had some for undergraduate and graduate. And then at Community Action Pioneer Valley, I kind of mentioned this before, but I uh, am working as a resource advocate because I was fortunate enough to have my internship transition into the full-time job that I'm working currently before I go to law school. And so all of these internships were really different, but what connects them is uh, through my concentration, you have to pick a focus. And so my concentration focus for community engagement and social change was racial justice, which is a very broad focus, but it gave me the ability to connect several very different experiences and strengthen a commitment to racial justice and get different perspectives on what that would look like. And so all of this to say is that my path to law school uh, is not and has not been linear. It took me through a lot of different directions because when I came here, I had a vague notion of what I wanted to do. And then I was like, maybe I want to do academia. Maybe I'm interested in social work. And it kind of clicked into place when I was doing all of my internships and especially the job that I'm doing right now. And I was constantly being like, wow, I need to talk to a lawyer. Um, and so I decided to cut out the middleman and go to law school to be one. <laughs> and 
So another experience that I got to do because of Smith was I went to the National Black Pre-Law Conference, which I uh, paid for by getting my conference funding. And so that's through the Lazarus Center. You get it every year. And so I also went to a different conference my first year before COVID hit, um, at, which was a poetry slam, which was completely different from this. But only 2% of lawyers are Black women. And so getting to go to the Black Pre-Law Conference was really invaluable to me because it gave me the ability to meet other people who were looking to go into the same career as me, but also had similar experiences of being the only person in their families or the only person in their like surrounding community who were looking into going into this profession. And so it was an awesome opportunity to network with people. And so uh, the thing that I've taken away from my Smith College career is that Smith does empower advocates. And so I mentioned before, but like I am a low income student who didn't have experience uh, with basically any higher education before I got to Smith. And so I was in a very different environment from what I was used to. And Smith gave me a lot of support to navigate an environment like this. And Smith gave me a lot of support that I needed to succeed in general. And so I'm really grateful to have had the opportunity to do so many different experiences and take away so many different things from them. Uh, and so uh, now that I have graduated, I'm post-grad but pre-law. And so I have been given the opportunity to go to Boston University School of Law on a full tuition scholarship as a Dean Scholar, which I'm thrilled about because I'm not going to have to go into crazy debt to get my law uh, degree. And until then, I'm going to be working at Community Action as a resource advocate. And so that was my experience as Smith as a pre-law student who is now going to be a law student. Wonderful. Oh, thank you so much to our three panelists today. Those were just phenomenal presentations and it was so wonderful to hear from each of you. And now um, we have time for a Q&A. So I'll start us off and folks feel free to add questions to the chat as we're going and um, Emily and I will post those to our panelists. So first question that we have for all of you is something that some of you have already touched on in your presentations, but what's one thing that really surprised you about the field in which you worked? Can I, I oh, sorry. Um, I would say that for me, one of the big things that I was really surprised about was, um, how like it wasn't I don't it wasn't as structured as I thought it might be like I kind of going into it had thought that there would have been a bit more of like telling me what to do and it was a lot more of like like I'm perfectly happy taking the initiative but there was more of that to be done than I had expected there to be um I so that was something that was definitely a bit surprising for me Uh, mine's a little bit more gloomy, but I honestly, in all of my experiences have been like, obviously in my own experience, I have been exposed to some of the structural problems that lead uh, people of color and people who are low income to uh, experience a lot of different adversity. And uh, in my current job as a resource advocate, I've learned that a lot of the government programs in Massachusetts specifically are not very proactive. And so um, if you're really behind on your rent, you aren't eligible for financial assistance from Community Action or the bigger organization raft, which is residential assistance for families in transition, uh, unless you have a notice to quit, which is the start of the eviction process. And so there are a lot of times where people will come and be like, I lost my job. I am going to uh, like be behind on my rent. I'm going to get a notice to quit in the future. Can you help me? And I have to be like, 
no, uh, come back later. And so there are people who are doing advocacy locally to try to get that policy changed, which I think is really exciting and important work. Uh, but it's definitely made me think a lot about how uh, when people are in like really hard situations, it's really easy to like continue getting trapped. And that's why it's really important that we have people who are doing advocacy work with different uh, groups such as immigrants. Uh, and so, yeah. Yeah, uh, one of the things that surprised me when I was um, learning about the asylum process is that one of the first things that migrants have to do um, is pass a credible fear interview, which to me was, and the, and the likelihood of them passing this interview is, is very low because they often go into it not knowing what to expect or not having had engaged with um, someone who can represent them and guide them through the process before actually uh, taking having the interview. Um, so that's basically just where an ICE officer interviews you for three hours and asks you why you are like why you are scared of your country, like why you need protection from the United States. Um, and to me, that was just a baffling fact that I learned about during the internship. Um, but also, I was surprised by my organization because they really focused on um, on they really cared about mental health, the mental health of the of their employees. Um, and so one of the things that they did was focus a lot on vicarious trauma training so that they could continue doing the work that they're so that they can continue the work that they're doing without burning out as fast because burnout rate in uh, when you work in immigration law is very high. So I felt like I was very taken uh, taken care of really well by my supervisors. And I could see that sort of um, community foster, that sort of uh, care fostered in, in that community as well. We have a, a question in the chat. Uh, this is for all the panelists. Um, do you remember specific classes at Smith that you think have helped you in your internship and educational paths? Um, I want to shout out uh, the Africana Studies Department at Smith. I am not an Africana Studies major, uh, but maybe I should have been. But there is a class taught by Professor Aaron Kamagisha, who's new to Smith, uh, called the Black Radical Tradition. And in it, I got uh, exposed to theory specifically by like Black political theorists. And that was really valuable because it shifted the way that I had been approaching political theory previously. And so I ended up doing an honors thesis about uh, Black political theory, specifically uh, reparations and housing discrimination and the like, juncture between the two. And I was able to do that because I took a class that made me realize that political theory wasn't just all like old white men who said that slavery was okay in some situations. Uh, and so I am honestly just really grateful for all of the classes I have taken with Professor Kamakisha because I've taken several and it's really expanded my ideas of what a field could be in general. My first year, I took a lot of classes um, about the Middle East. So I remember being in um, a class called Syria Beyond the Headlines, which in which we learned about the the Syrian uh, the Syrian crisis, and um, uh, I learned about refugees there. Uh, but also, it you know, I mean, how I said in my presentation, I my foundation of my knowledge is is personal um it's it's from my family experience um you know hearing them share their um their their stories about it but, but this year i am taking or last semester i took a class on latin american political systems which really reinforced what i had learned at the internship and right now i'm at in a class called um 
the politics of the U.S.-Mexican border. So we're with with uh, Professor Velma Garcia. She taught both of those classes, and she's um, in the Latin American uh, Studies Department, but also the Government Department. Um, those those courses are cross listed. Um, so we're talking a lot about this, and I think it's really interesting. So it just makes me more more passionate and. I'm I'm excited to go to those classes. I'm excited to be learning about this. Um, so those are those are the types of classes that I've taken that relate to the work that I did over the summer. Um, for me, I feel like <clears throat> I my first year was spent experimenting with a lot of different courses, a lot of which weren't actually related to government. Um, but anyways, in terms of government specific courses that I did, I mean. A lot of them more kind of taught us about, as, I mean, very informative, like my American government course, you more learn about the structures of which all oh, very important things to know and why things work the way they do. But I feel like a lot of the experience I had this summer, um, they like the, like seeing how things play out on the ground and how different levels of government interact and how policies are shaped and worded and how people can kind of um, manipulate things to create systems in which kind of disadvantage groups or kind of like what other people have alluded to make systems as hard as possible to navigate even though they should be there to help like across the board for everything um, and so I think in the future I'd be more interested in taking public policy specific classes but that was just something I haven't really done but it still this experience did it like illuminated a lot of the facts and structures that I've learned in my other classes and kind of helped create an overall like I don't know more of a working image of what the systems actually look like instead of just the textbook definitions. Thank you to all of you. We have another question for everyone, which is, what would you do to empower and educate others on these issues? I think, I think one of the main parts of empowerment is, is being able to talk about it. Um, and if you want, you can, you can look up the Santa Fe Dreamers project on, on Google and you'll be brought up to their page and they have a lot of um, resources on there about immigration law and the system. And you can sign up for their for their weekly or for you know their newsletters that they send out. They usually give immigration updates on there too. Um, but it just starts with a conversation um, so that's why I try to get a lot of a lot of my friends to come so that they could, you know, learn a little bit about this. And I think it's just obviously it wasn't enough time to be able to talk about everything that I wanted to address, but um, we just barely skimmed the surface. But I, I think there's just so much more that that people can 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 do to learn about this. Yeah, and I want to like second that the importance of conversations. And I think that, um, for example, I took the classes that Sutlali was talking about a few years back. And one of the things that stuck with me was the Library of Congress has images of Bracero workers from Mexico getting uh, sprayed with pesticides while they were at the US-Mexico border as they were coming in. Um, and obviously those are toxic chemicals. And so one day I was on Instagram and I reposted that picture and one of my friends from home, cause I'm from Arizona, which is really close to the border and has a lot of uh, border politics in that state um, she slid up on my story and she was like I didn't know that this happened and like I'm Mexican like my family is like from Mexico and so because of that I was able to have like a more in-depth conversation with her about the things that I had learned about in class. And so I think that it's really important, especially as a Smithy who's been given the opportunity to have like an amazing, amazing education to introduce people to new things and then also be able to share the knowledge that you've been getting in classes because like we have, we're a liberal arts college, we have an open curriculum. And so we have the 
flexibility to get to uh, learn different things and take classes in different majors. And so like I was taking Latin American studies courses, which isn't um, like directly what I ended up studying. And so, yeah, I think that we get like a lot of freedom and flexibility and we can take all of the things that we get to learn about and share them with our communities. Um, and just kind of going off of what both of them have already talked about is like, I think it is very important, like, <laughs> obviously, the um, just to have conversations about, like, what is happening within each state specifically, um, while there are some issues that, you know, only the federal government can address, there's a lot, like, way more than I ever thought was, like, there, like the, the, there is so much room for control at the state level and I mean I feel like I kind of going back to it like just an, like I think of myself as a very politically like informed and engaged person but when I actually started thinking about it I realized that I couldn't name my state senator and I feel like that's an experience that I'm not speaking for everyone that most people probably have but these people like actually have so much control over what happens in your life and the lives of the other people so really kind of if you have the time and energy and abilities to try to have conversations about what is specific to your state instead of focusing on like oh well my senator did this because you know bigger impact on the lower levels Thank you, everybody. Um, so I have a question as a as a Lazarus Center staff. Um, as you might imagine, students are really coming in to talk about how to find internships right now, uh, looking for summer internships. And I think you three are really good success stories in finding these really impactful internships. So I wonder if you have any advice for uh, other Smith students who are currently in the search process. I think that it's crazy that Smith gives us so much money to do unpaid work and all of my friends, like I have friends who go to ASU, which is Arizona State, huge school. They do not have the funding opportunities that we do. And I really, really, really suggest that people take advantage of those. Um, like a lot of internships in my field were unpaid. I would not have been able to do a lot of my internships if I hadn't been paid um, or do the internship that actually got me this job. Uh, so something that I would also recommend to people who are later in the game and about to graduate, the reason that I chose the internship that at Community Action was because they had a vacant job posting and I was like, if I'm a good enough intern, they'll offer me a job. And that's exactly what happened. So I think we have the opportunity to be really strategic about the opportunities that we take advantage of. And yeah, like it's with college, there's so much money here, like take it. Yeah, um, as a first year, I remember really feeling stressed out about trying to find an internship for that summer. And I remember I was looking on um, a lot of different, I was looking for really like top tier internships at think tanks and, you know, these really like fancy, hard to get into internships. And I would say that that's awesome. You should definitely do that research. But try not to spend so much energy, especially as a first year working towards those applications. I would say start small, find, an, find a nonprofit organization that um, works on things that you're interested in, because I think that will give you the foundation of um, the work that you wanna do. And it's also an incredible experience too. And you have Praxis funding to, um, be able to support you since most internships at nonprofits are on page. So um, I would say start small and then um, and then go big. Kind of echoing um, that is that don't also be afraid to like reach out to some of these small nonprofits because a lot of the times they might not have specific intern positions advertised because they are you know, not these massive like corporations. 
Um, but a lot of the times, and this is something that I've actually been <laughs> doing recently, but if you reach out to people like organizations directly and say, hi, I'm just interested in learning about this and getting opportunity, I feel like more often than not, you might get some sort of response. And you, by taking and showing initiative that, I mean, it's just a good thing to have, but um, you can like create your own opportunities sometimes. And I feel like that's something that people are very scared to do, but can definitely do. Also part of creating your own opportunities when you reach out to uh, these people, um, tell, them, tell them why you're interested, tell them that you're interested in, in interning for them for the summer, but don't tell them in that first email that Smith can fund you. Try and see if that org can pay you. And then if they say they can't pay you, then tell them that you will be supported by Smith and that's I that's how I would play it that's how I did play it <laughs> I also one other thing is that it really is a lot of people at Smith know a lot of people uh via the alum network or people who like for example this job I also got because the director of the Janin Center knows the director of community action and so when I emailed them they were like okay whatever and then when he emailed them and then CC the director they were like oh um and so like Smith has a really valuable network and especially like if you're someone who doesn't have connections like now you're at Smith College so you do have connections and you should really take advantage of that that was all amazing advice thank you so much <laughs> absolutely well we're gonna wrap up for today and I want to thank again our wonderful panelists so appreciate you sharing your experiences and your wisdom with us. And thank you to our audience for all of your questions and participation and support. Um, I hope everyone enjoyed this session as much as we did. And Emily's gonna drop in the chat our, the YouTube playlist for past Smith in the World presentations. And when this one's edited, it'll be up there as well. Um, so thank you all, have a, a good rest of your day and a good weekend and be well.